Parshas Breishis, Mechachachma. Breishis. How do we translate that? Breishis, Bar Elohim. What is Breishis? Rameir Simcha quotes the Targum Yonatsan, Bechachma. God created the world with Chachma. And the Meshachachma gives us a pointer to study the Ramban. The Ramban has a very extensive uh, treatise and presentation on Bracious Barlokim. It goes on for pages and pages. If perhaps we could summarize the gist or the highlight of the Ramban, we would say that God created something called, and he, the Ramban invokes a Greek term, Hiyuli, Chomer Harishon, right? The original, the original matter was called Hiyuli by the Greeks. And that is bara, that's creation. Now with Hiyuli, God continues to create all the different parts of the universe. That's called not Bria, but rather that's called Yitzira. And the Ramban writes that with Chila Baralukim, God first created this Chomer Hiyuli, this formless matter. And Ramban speaks about the name Elohim in this context, Bala Kochos Kulam, Bores Hashamayim, Vahotzi, Chomer Shalahemi Ayin. And matter comes from absolute non existence. And the Ramban speaks about a point which has no substance to it. Let's see if I can find that line here. Uh, he goes through the four years. Sodos. Yom Elokim Yehi'or. The Ramban identifies that as Machshava. And Vayehi is Havaya. Morel Maises Man. It's, uh, it's really a, a job, you know, to work through this Ramban you know, piece by piece, he talks about Tova Vo. It's it's hard to say which exact point in this long Ramban is the most important point which Rameer Simcha is, is asking us to learn about. I mean, at one point, the Ramban says that milas breishis tirmos be eses viros nivra ha'olam. And then, if breishis is a remez to the ten spheros, then the first of the ten is the sphera of Hanikres Chachma, Sheba Yisod Kol. Kedian Shenemar quoting a poskim Mishlei Hashem Bechachma Yasad Oretz. So it seems like the Ramban has the same interpretation 
of the word breaches as the Targum Yonah son. I mean, Targum Yonah son doesn't mention all 10 spheres, but the first meaning Chachma, and the Ramban puts a tremendous emphasis on Chachma. And this reflects, says Rabbi Simcha Gemara in Sanhedrin on Daf Lamed Ches, Zumi Doso Shal Kodesh Baruch Shebaras Kala Olam Bechachma. Which if not for Rabbi Simcha, we would have said it means that God created the entire universe with wisdom, not, not that wisdom was the power or the force, but rather that uh, it was a wise uh, creation. Vinirla Hasbir Alpi Mashahevi Besefer Avodas HaKodesh. Avodas HaKodesh is a Kabbalistic work that's been republished many, many times. And he tells you where in that Sefer you could find this. That Sefer quotes the Kadmonit, the earlier commentaries. And he writes that Ein Sof, which is the infinite God, who Shlemus Miblichi Sara, is absolute perfection. Vim Tomar Shieshlo Koch Beligvul. If you're going to describe God as a power that is limitless, Beligvul, the Ainlo Koch Begvul. But then you're going to say, well, that which is limited, God is out of God's realm, right? It doesn't belong to God. And God has no power over that which is bigvul. Then by postulating that way, you are undermining the concept of God as shlem. So God is perfection. And therefore, he must have a power, a dominion over the limited world, over the material finite world, because if he doesn't have any power over the finite world, then you've reduced the perfection of God to an imperfection, because you've limited his powers. And that's a quote from a sefer called the Avodas HaKodesh. Vani Mosif. Meshachachma wants to embellish the words of the Avodos HaKodesh. Hare Muvan, Shema Sheyesh Ain Sof, Livro Dover Bigvul Betachlis, the potential for God who is infinite to create that which is finite, Gam Hu Belogvul, that potential is also limitless, infinite. Shahar gvulin libli tachlis, there is an unlimited choice or possibility, bekach in potential, for the ein sof livro beli gvul. In other words, when God creates, he, with a capital H, has an infinite number of possibilities of what he could create. There is no limit to the choices that God has in front of him as to what he can create. Not Shabachar, but God chose, and this is Chachma, Bekach HaGvul Hazeh HaNivra. God chose the creation of all existing things as we know it. This is one of infinite possibilities. I don't know if you've ever thought about this. To me, this was a, a bit of an eye opener. You know, look around at this world that God created and then contemplate the idea that this is one world 
there's an infinite number of possibilities of which world God could have created. That's part of the infinite ain't self of HaKadosh Baruch. He has limitless, unrestricted possibilities. Ulafi said, Nazbir sod hamochid. And now Rabbi Simcha invokes a Kabbalistic concept called mochin. What is mochin? Mochin is the thought and the decision of Ein Sof to create the world as we know it. That's the secret of mochin. Ki may Ein Sof livro mitzius gvuli the decision itself made by the Almighty God, Ein Sof, infinite God, to create finite existence, that is the mochin of some sort of a metaphysical and infinite nature. The gamze yitochen biblikvul, biofanim ein nispa. And the precise existence that God could bring into existence is infinite. V'zendikra keter. That's another concept in Kabbalah, in Jewish mysticism, called keter, the crown. And the crown is some sort of primordial will, with a capital W, of the Almighty, to decide which of those infinite possibilities, again, there's a double decision. Number one, the decision fundamentally to create. And number two, what to create. When we say that God created from ayin, what do we mean by ayin? That until he creates yesh, when we're in the realm of ayin, there's limitless possibilities. Vunelam basogas, or mea sogas, I think it should say, shum nimtza. This is beyond the comprehension of any created being. As a created being, we cannot conceive of ayin, of an infinite possibilities of what to create, of what to bring into existence, because we have no comprehension of infinity. Infinity is beyond our comprehension. Because we are finite beings. The Achakach Kishabachar Lasos Gvul Menagvulin, when God chose which particular material he wants to bring into existence, Asher Libli Tachlis, and there were limit, limitless possibilities, Koach Ze Mikra Chachma. Koach Ma. It's a power that comes from Ma, meaning from Ayin from an infinite number of possibilities. How do you choose one from infinity? And when he chose this particular form of existence, as we know it to be today, who bina? This already goes from one level of chachma to a second level of bina. So Chachma, the way he understands it, is the decision of God to choose one method or one form of existence from an infinite number of possibilities. And once he makes that choice, he with the capital H, right, makes the choice of which gvul, of which finite creation he wants to generate into existence, that's called Bina. And why? Why does God choose this existence? Ubachar bazer bigvul, amongst the various possibilities that are infinite, he chose this one. Machmas shahaya arevlo. This is the one that found favor in the eyes of God. Arev. If I could add my own little footnote here, I don't know if this is true. When you enjoy a certain food, it's not necessarily a kind of cause and effect relationship. We don't know exactly 
why we enjoy or Ruvain enjoys this food, Shimon enjoys that food. That's called RA flow. That's what he enjoys. It's RA flow. It's pleasant in him. And Rabbi Simcha stands on the shoulders of a Medrash and Bracious Rabba, Din Hanyanli. This one is a Hana for me. God declares that this creation that I chose from the infinite possibilities, the one that I enjoy. And the Medrash adds a word, Mesikos. Mesikos means it's sweet. Sweet is something that we enjoy. People, generally speaking, tend to enjoy that which is sweet. But Vatam Sha'orev La'ain Sof Bigvul Zeh. And if you ask me for a rational, logical reason why God chose God the Infinite, this particular Gvul, Yosef Mishar Gvul, Gvulim, I can't answer you, but I can give it a name, and that's called Das. So the Das is the bridge between Chachma and Bina. Lashon Chibur, the word Das in etymological Hebrew means Chibur, connection, a bridge that connects two places. Chachma and Bina, you have to bridge between Chachma and Bina. And that's called Das. And Das reflects on that which is Arevlo, that which is pleasant in the, so to speak, divine perspective. And then he quotes a Zohar, they trade Ryan, the Lomus Parchi. You know, these are not things that we can really necessarily understand. Lachay Das, Leslie Bechushbin, the Esav Lachadisar. This he thinks, Rameer Simcha believes, is the interpretation of the opinion of the Kadmonim that was quoted in the Sefer of Odessa Let's go on. Rashi points out that according to the sequence and the way the parsha uses the language, the first, the second, which I believe, if I'm not mistaken, please correct me on this, is called ordinal numbers. Rashi raises the question, why does it say Echad? And the Ramban, in his commentary, says, the reason why it says Echad and not Yom Rishon is because there wasn't a second. When you have number one, then you already can begin a sequence. But you can't begin a sequence when you don't even have the first. So you can't call the first the first because there is no second. You can call the second the second because it's be, it follows the first and precedes the third. And therefore, the Ramban says that the Torah had to use the word echad. However, Rameer Simcha takes it upon himself to offer another interpretation. Omar echad velo rishon lefisha rishon v'sheni when you call something the first and then the second, there's a relationship between the two. They belong to one plane, P-L-A-N-E. This is the first, this is the second. They're all on the way, you know, sort of a, a race. You compare them one to the other. One is more limited than the other, and so forth and so on. However, what was created on day one? The Hine Abriya shall or the Bria of the first day was light. And now Rabbi Simcha quotes a Gemara Chagig on Dafyu Beis. Rosh Eina Olam Kedai Lich Tamish Bo Ugnazo. The Gemara says, 
that the R that was created by Kodesh Baruch on the first day was such that Adam Tzofa Bo Misofa Olamo Ad Sofa the Kevin Shin Istakil Bidara Mabul Ubidara Flaga the Rosh and Masaya Mikulkolim Ahmad Vigonzo Man God hid that light in Kena Briashala R says Ramesh of Chenivra Biom Rishon Hoyeba Madrega Gva Mi Brias Aulam. That creation of R on the first day was above the entire universe that was created subsequently on the second, etc. days. In other words, the creation of the first day, namely R, belongs to a category of its own. It cannot be compared to any of the other creations of day two, day three, day four. What does the word echad mean? As opposed to Rishon, it's not the first, it's one. To echad b'madregaso u'b'matzavo. It is one on a qualitative basis and it is on a dargon, on a level that cannot be, you cannot even make a comparison. You know, you can say, well, you have two created beings, existing beings. One is this, the other is that. This was superior. So you can't talk about R in the same breath with all the other creations because R belongs to something that's above nature, above material creation. And that's why God took that R and he hid it, we for the Lamo, for the time of redemption. The Enom Sudorim Ze Keneged Ze. The first day cannot be organized in a sequence together with the other six days. Because the other days are days of creation of something that belongs to this physical restricted, limited world, whereas the R of day one doesn't belong to this physical world. It is a spiritual, or shall we call it a primordial light that can only belong to the world to come. And therefore, hence, the Torah chooses the word echad as opposed to rishon. Rishon would imply that the creation of the first day it's the first day, and then it's the second day, and the third day. And those ordinal numbers indicate that there's a possibility of comparison. They all belong to one plane, one world, and that's not so. So whereas the Ramban says the word echad is only chosen here because you can't call something Rishon when there's no Shani, you have to call it echad. When you have something in existence that's Rishon and Shani and Shlishi, you can call it Rishon. That's the Ramban's Derech Hapshat. But the advantage of Ramir Simcha is that he's using Torah Shaval Peh, meaning the Gemara and Chagiga, on Dafyud Beis to shed a new light on the Torah's deliberate use of the word Echad to describe the R that was created on the first day as opposed to the word Rishon. Now, once we're talking about creation, I would like to fast forward to another paragraph in Rabbi Meir Simcha. Now, if you happen to have, by any chance, the same text that I have, it's on page Yudal, page 14. You may be able to find it, even if you don't have the same text as me, in Perek Gimel of Bracious, the Psukim Dalit Tehe. He has a paragraph in bold print, it's called Arba Mesu Be'itio Shal Nachash. He quotes a Gemara Baba Basra Daf Yud Zion that there were four individuals during the course of Jewish history who should not have died. They should have lived 
to immortality, if not for the itio shel nachash, which Rashi interprets at soso shel nachash, which means that as a result of the nachash and the recommendation that he gave to Chava, etc., etc., there was a gzera of Misa on the world. And that means that anyone who descends from Adam Arishon would die. And we all descend from Adam Arishon. But there were four individuals that are isolated here in the Gemara. Binyamin, the son of Yaakov, Amram, the father of Moshe, Yishai, the father of David, Kalev, the father, the son of David. These are four individuals who died without any sin. And they died because of the itio shel nachash. And the classic understanding of that Gemara before Rebbeir Simcha, the way Rashi understood it, is that as a result of the etza of nachash, the physical body of man changed, underwent a, underwent a change in a way that now we would have to either sooner or later die. So the original physical nature of man was such that he could live to mortality, but as a result of the nachash and the aftermath, man's physical nature changed in such a way that we have to die. That's the way we understand it yoshel nachash before Reb Meir Simcha. Reb Meir Simcha reinterprets the word it yo instead of etza, which is Rashi's interpretation, he interprets it as hata'a. Hata'a is Miloshin and ta'us. And what that means is that as a result of the nachash, there was a very dangerous ta'us that became very dangerous after the sin. And that's why God had to introduce death into the world. So in order to understand this toes, this mistake, which would have been very dangerous had man been granted immortality, which again, before the sin was the original plan, the original scheme of God was man would be immortal. But now after sin, the Nachash gave an itio, a toes, a very dangerous mistake. And as a result of that mistake, God had to declare and decree death upon man. So according to Rabbi Simcha, the decree of death is not a result and a reflection of the physical change of man's body as a result of itio shal nachash, the way Rashi understood it, but rather the itio shal nachash, there's a toes. And in order to avoid such a terrible toes, God had to declare and decree death. What was that toes? Rameer Simcha, in order to clarify the toes, he uses what I call the method of comparison. Sometimes you don't understand X unless you compare it and contrast it with Y. And here, Abir Simcha describes the Gal Galib, which are the planets, the celestial spheres. Chayim v'kayomim liolam. They are granted immortality. The planets will always exist. But the Heim Enom Bale Ratzon, they don't have the will, meaning the ability to decide, Lishanos Mahalchon, to change their orbit. They have been created by God. Each planet, respectively, has its orbit. And no planet, no celestial sphere, has the ability to change, to make a decision. Lo yeshanu es tafkidam, as we say. They cannot change 
the way that God gave them that natural ability and why. If the planets would be granted freedom, then we have a very dangerous possibility. And perhaps Rabbi Simcha is referring to the entire development of what we call Avodas Kochavim. He says the toes is that they would convince themselves. Again, he, tr- he treats the planets as intelligent beings. Ayn Rambam, Hiltus, Yisori, Yator, Perkalev. And he writes that the Tos was Shehei Manhigim Yertzonam. That they are in the driver's seat. They are in control of their movements. The Lasseis Kvot Elokim And they should deserve the glory of a God. They are so powerful, given their freedom, that they are like a a deity. And that would be very dangerous if, heaven forbid, we, man, would interpret the powers and decision ability, the freedom of the planets as a deity, as a power, as an original source of power. But since the planets have no freedom, there's no room for mistake. Hello, Roim, it's obvious. Their orbits are not a matter of their decision. They don't have the ability to make any change whatsoever. They are totally mukhrach. And therefore, they cannot be divine beings because they have no freedom. They are totally meshubad to the divine will. And who is the first one to reveal this truth? Who is none other than Avram Avinu. And here, Amir Simcha invokes Elio Zuto, one of the Midrashim. And the Midrashim say that Avram Avinu looked up at the sky. He saw the planets. So during the course of the day, he worshipped the planets. And then at night, there was a whole new group of planets. And he worshipped those planets till the next day when he realized that the planets are just moving in their orbit. They have no freedom of choice. And that's how Avram Avinu discovered the one God. Now, by contrast, man. Avala Adam Bachir. Man is granted freedom of choice. He can decide which orbit he wants to circulate in. The Imaya Chayli Olam, if the original plan of God would come to fruition and man would be granted immortality, then as no felatoyus liyaches lo inyan elokus. If man lives forever and he's granted freedom of choice, then he is an, an omnipotent being. He has limitless powers. And he will appoint himself as a God figure. Hence the mistake. So once man is granted freedom of choice, if he also has immortality, then he can be past. They can pass, they can propose and present him and understand him to be a deity. Once man sinned, rebelled against God, and abused his freedom of choice, then now it becomes really a serious fear that he would appoint himself 
announce himself as a god, as a deity figure. But now he becomes a bent Musa. The only way of guaranteeing that such a mistake would not come to fruition is by removing his immortality and making you into mortal man. Laman Yeda, so he has to know and appreciate. Kiach, what is he? Hevel, Nidav. Vachriso, Rima. He's like a driven leaf, and his end is the worms. The Yedu Akol. And now man has to admit, God is the creator. That man, on the one hand, violated the will of God by eating from the Eitz Adas, and as a result, the Eight Sahara enters into man's very being. He is now in a situation of Bechira, and his entire life is one long challenge. But at the same time, simultaneous with man's freedom of choice is man's, immor- is man's mortality. Because if he has freedom of choice and he could abuse that freedom of choice and he's immortal, then he would come to that terrible mistake and postulate and present himself as a deity. So just to summarize, we have now two distinct and different interpretations of the Ityo Shal Nachash. Rashi understood that Ityo Shal Nachash means that as a result of the enticement of the Nachash and man's sin, he would be punished with mortality. But Mayor Simcha sees it otherwise. God himself declared that man would be mortal. Not the way Rashi understood it because man's physical body changed and now he can no longer be immortal. But rather, God decreed that it's impossible to grant man immortality. It would lead to the greatest of totems. So we see something about creation now that the original creation of man was immortal and man had a limited type of freedom of choice. It was all external to man, but this changed and God declared mortality after Adam violated eight from the eight sadas in order to avoid that toast that we described in great detail. And now, I would like to take a look at the Haftorah, which we'll read Amir Shem tomorrow from Yeshaya Perkmem Gimel in Rav Meir Simcha. The Pasuk, it's the 10th Verse in Perak Mem Gimel of Yeshai is somewhat ambiguous. Laman Tedu Vitaminuli, that you should know and believe. So we're talking about faith. But then it says Vitavinu, which means comprehension. Faith is above rational understanding. Vitavinu, and what's it all about? Kianihu. I am God. There's no God before me that was created and no God after me. What's it all about? Pirish, what is the subject of this pasuk? Says Rabbi Simcha, Ki al heder mitzius chomer kadu. The entire issue here is Chomer Kadum. The phrase Chomer Kadum was coined by Aristotle and the Rambam in his Mornavuchim tries to disprove Aristot- Aristotelian Chomer Kadum philosophy. 
otherwise known in the language of the philosophers as the eternity of the universe. The universe, according to Aristotle, was eternal. It always existed. That's called Chomer Kadu. Kadu means always. There was always physical matter. From Aristotle's perspective, God and physical matter are two separate entities. Each exists on its or on their own. And Aristotle denied creation. The Rambam dedicates many chapters to disprove the Aristotelian philosophy of the eternity of the universe. The universe was not eternal. It was created at one moment by the Almighty God. And at that moment, all of existence was non-existence, what we call iron. There was nothing in existence. And Rameer Simcha says that the declaration in this puzzle that we're reading here in the Aftorah for Brachis is absolutely critical. Why? Because the philosophy of Judaism, of creation, Yesh Mi'ayin, has no mofis. No Ba hamofis. Mofis means a rational proof. We have no proof to creation yesh me'ayin. As the Ramam points out in the Mor Nevuch. So what is the scorecard here? On the one hand, there's no proof that matter, physical matter, always existed. And that's what the Ramam spent so much time on to disprove all the arguments of Aristotle to prove the eternity of matter of the universe. But on the other hand, we have no proof of the creation of existence, yesh me'ayin, meaning that there was no matter, no universe, and then God created the universe. This is what you call a stalemate. What, what do they call it in chess? A stalemate, right? Did I get that right? In Hebrew, they call it a teku, even the modern Israelis. So why do we believe, and here's where the word amuna in our apostle is critical, in creation, yesh me'ayin? The answer is, because we trust Moshe Rabbeinu and before him, Avram Avinu, Shepirsimu, because they revealed Kiamitsius, all of existence, Nivru, came into existence by an act of God, Ritsono Yisbarach, Min Ha'ayna from total non existence. Can you prove that? Is there any philosophical argument that can establish creation, Yechmiayin? The Ramam says no. But we're going to rely on our greats, our, our great ancestors, on Avram and Moshe Rabbein, who taught us, it's like what you call part of the Mesorah, that God created Yesh Me'ayin. Ulam says Rabbi Simcha, although from a pure philosophical perspective, if we leave out the Mesorah, you would want to have a proof for creation Yesh Me'ayin but there's one thing that doesn't require proof at all. And what is that? That there could be anything in existence like the creator. The creator is almighty God, the first prime cause of everything. Nimna means it's logically unacceptable. I don't need any proof for that. Shekoba sheyia o yivra hu alul 
Once we accept the principle of creation, then everything that's created is all. All means an effect, E-F-F-E-C-T, right? It's cause and it's an effect. The effect is always different and inferior to the cause. The cause that creates something and generates existence is always that much greater than the effect, the all. The all is the effect. For who all had tluya b'siboso? Siboso is the cause, the prime mover, the prime cause, that's the Almighty. And the all is the created existing universe. Lo, meaning that which is created cannot be an Ila Rishona, first primary cause. And that's Nimna Mitzad Atzma, that we understand without needing any proof. We don't require proof to understand that, that which is created and brought into existence by the prime mover could not possibly be the same as the prime mover. V'lo Yitar Hashem b'yecholes al kol elu. In other words, for this point, to say that something that is created, we can relate, relate to it as God, that's, that, that's impossible. And he tells you to look in the Marna food. Now let's see how Rameer Simcha, based on this presentation, share, shades a new, share, uh, sh- um, shares a new light with us, sheds a new light on the Pasuk in Yishai. Lachain Omar. There are two things that are indicated in this possible. Number one, Lefanai lo notzarkel. Nothing was created before me. Meaning, at this point, God is denying, the Pasuk is denying the Aristotelian philosophy of the eternity of the universe. Because Lefanai lo notzarkel. There was nothing created before me, says God. Who, what is this notzar? Chomer kadum. That's the Aristotelian belief in the, in the eternity of, of matter. Shalom nivra mirtsono, which according to Aristotle was chomer, was material being that came into existence without the divine creator, without the divine will. But I'll say Omar, leman ta'aminu. You have to believe. This is faith. You have no proof to disprove Aristotelian eternity of the universe. But then the Pesach says, that there will be no God after me. For that, all you have to have is an intelligent comprehension. It's logically impossible that something that was created by God could be godlike, could itself be a prime mover, a prime cause. But let's go back to the Pusik now and read the Pusik the way Rabir Simcha wants us to read it. In other words, the Pusik opens up with two words. One is emuna. The other is Bina. And now we're going to have, it's kind of like A, B, A, B, if you know what I mean. Now we're going to figure out what is the subject of Amuna and what is the subject of Havana. Before me, there was no creation. That's Amuna. But Achorai, Acharai, Lo after me, there will be no other kale, there will be no other godly figure, prime mover. Ain't so. That already is Bina. That comes under understand. Now, I thought that at this point, I would like to see something later on in Safer Bracious that perhaps could tie into everything that we discussed, maybe. So what I'd like to do now 
is fast forward to Pasha's Vayera. And if you have a Chumash, it's Perkhov Bey's Posigid Dalit. And there's a massive presentation here in Rameir Simcha. I'm only going to focus on one small part of this massive presentation. The issue at stake here is the Makam Amigdash and its name. And we have two approaches. We have one approach of Malki Tzedek. And Malki Tzedek is called Melech Shalem in Breshis Yudalit Posuk Yudches. But here in Perak of Beis Posuk Yudal, Vayikra from Shema Makom Hahu Hashem Yira'eh in the at the end of the Akedah. So what is the name of Yerushalayim? The Medjish points out that Shem, who is Malki Tzedek, the son of Noah, he called Yerushalayim Shalem. Avram called the same location Yire. And Rabbi Simcha wants to present a picture in which both both Shem, Ben Noach, and Avram are coming to teach the world that which they have to learn. You know, I very often I ask myself the question, I don't know if you've ever asked yourself. If we had the ability to teach the world, what would we want to teach the world? And you'd probably get a myriad of different answers. Well, here in Rameer Simch, we have two answers. We have the Shalem answer of Shem ben Noach and the Yira answer of Avram. What was the answer of Shem ben Noach Shalem? Says Rameir Simcha, and again, if you happen to have the same Chumash as I do, it's page Kuf Samaches in the middle of this long presentation. He says, Zemora Shalem. What is the meaning of the word Shalem? Sholem means one complete, indivisible entity. All of mankind, the entire human race, is one Adam. I mean, it sheds a whole new light on creation. You know, we think of creation as Adam Arishon, God created Adam Arishon, and then Adam Arishon had children and propagated through the generations. No, all those generations are Adam. There's one unified, indivisible man who is created. That's called Shalit. Call Echad the Echad who Ever me every Adam Gadol. Every individual is just a limb of a greater man. Call Echad Nitzrach Lechavero. Just like every limb of the body depends upon another limb, and each limb contributes, and the organism is created as a whole. So too, all of mankind, the human race as a whole, is one indivisible organism made up of different limbs of one body. Mushpa umashpia zemize. There's no Robinson Crusoe here. Everyone is either influenced or influences or does both. Vekulam ki echad, and all of mankind as one. No sim. They carry kium, the continued existence of the min and oshi, of the human race, vinitz chuso and its netzach and its eternal. Adkan hakofal. That's shame's teaching. And I say to myself, wow, if all the nations of the world you know, including the Iranians and the Talibinians and the uh, and 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 the Americans would would believe that we're all part of one Adam, and that God created Kol Min Hanoshi Ka Adam Echad. Could you imagine what an impact on the world that would be? And that's the teaching of Shalem of Yerushalayim. Amnon, 
Now, the word omnom is a key word because omnom introduces a contrast. Avram, he has a different teaching, a different legacy that he wants to leave for the world. He was very much into philosophical analyses, didactics. And his point was to teach to undermine the mistakes of the generation. He will engage them in philosophical debate. Chakar Besichlo, he used his profound intellectual analytic talents and capabilities, Kiyesh, to decide and the, to reveal Hashem Echad. There's one God. And this God is not the Aristotelian God who is divorced, as we discussed earlier, from the natural universe. But who is the God? Hashem Echad Shemashgiach Alakol. He is involved in this world. Velo Masar Hashkechoso. And don't make any mistakes. The Hashkoch of Hashem was not transmitted to the hands of the Kochavim. Like the Amuna of the Tzaba, which the Ramah Mimaravuchim expands upon. Umishum Zet Soli Avram Hashem Yireh. Avram will pray Hashem Yireh. Yira means God will see. God is aware of our actions. This is the Yisod, the fundamental underpinnings of all of morality. And that we have to fulfill the will of God and don't fool yourself. God is Mashkiach and God supervises. And Hashem Yira. So if we take the entire picture, the two names of the Mokom Migdash of Yushalayim, this Sholem from Shem Ben Noach, and this Yire of Avram Avinu, we see that there are two dimensions, two parts of a whole, two sides of a coin, of what we have to give and transmit as a legacy to the entire human race. Number one, to teach them that all of mankind is part of one Adam, one entity, limbs, that belong to one single organism. And number two, to teach the world that there's one God who is involved and manig and mashkiach. He hasn't given over the reins to anyone. And that teaching is that Hashem Yira, that God sees and God is aware of everything. And in a sense, perhaps one could suggest that what Rameer Simcha is doing here is he is integrating both Bein Adam Lamakom and Bein Adam Lechaviru. Morality and the belief in one God, monotheism, these are two sides of the same coin. This is what we are meant to teach the world. Now, I know we ran out of time, so I'll just point out where the next Rameer Simcha is that I wanted to discuss with you today in Sefer Bracious to sort of round off our discussion about creation. And that is in Perek Yudches, of Sefer Bracious, I'm sorry, just one second. Just one second, I'm sorry. I just, I'll, I'll let you go very momentarily. I just want to see. Eric Lamed Bays, I stand corrected. Pasuk Vav, it's actually 
the opening section of Ramir Simcha the Pashas Vayishla. Vayhili Shar Vachamar. We've discussed this Ramir Simcha in the past, but there's one line here which really we missed, I think, in the past, and it sheds a new light on the creation of man. So officially, we'll stop here. If you have two more minutes, three more minutes, I'll just read to you this critical line. He says, HaNefesh HaBahami Kanui L'Nefesh HaMedaberes Man is made up as a hybrid creation of two elements, two souls. There's the soul, which is called Medaberes, which is endowed with intellect. And then there's the Nefesh HaBahami, the animalistic soul of man. But he says that the animalistic soul is like if I can use the word property, that's owned and possessed by the Nefesh HaMedaberes. The Nefesh HaMedaberes, in a sense, owns its physical, animalistic soul. And that's a new interpretation of the Pasuk back in the story of creation when it says, Morachem v'chitchem yiu al kol chaya sa'aretz meaning that the animals and the beasts that roam the earth are afraid of man. They're, they're in awe of man, and they fear man. And that means in a, if you interpret it metaphorically, it means that the animal within man subjugates itself to the nefesh, Hamadaberis. But he says the other way around, it doesn't work. Lo chen nefesh hamadaberis eno kanu lizulasa. The nefesh hamadaberis, the intellect, is not subjugated to any domination except for one. Rak la shem yisbarak. Only to God in heaven. So that the hierarchy is that on the bottom level, the base, that's the Nefesh HaBahami, we go up to the second dimension of man as a created being, and that's the Nefesh HaMedaberes, which is in control and subjugates the Nefesh HaBahami. And on top of the Nefesh HaMedaberes is HaKadosh Baruch Hu, is Hashem Yisbarach. So that if man as an intellectual being owns, possesses, and dominates his physical material element, the Nefesh HaMahamis, then God, as the ultimate creator, controls and dominates man as a Nefesh Medaberes. And therefore, man as a Nefesh Medaberes, as a spiritual intellectual being endowed with Selim Elohim, is called upon to subjugate himself to the ultimate will of Hashem Yisrael. Okay, this is where we'll stop for today. And the Mr. Hashem, wish you all a great Shabbos, Parshas, Gracious. Thank you for joining me. Shabbat and Shabbat Shalom. We should, we should only hear, only hear good.